You know, uh, as Mark Myers said, who is our staff uh, parish chair, um, I believe it was last week, um, he says, I've been appointed here for an eighth year to lead this congregation. And as an elder, we lead it in four ways. Um, uh, One is in word, which is preaching and teaching. In sacrament, which is administering the sacraments. And um, order is essentially in charge of the administrative aspects of the church. And then service is to work to embody the teachings of Christ in this church and in the community. And as I have been thinking about this church family along with my calling here, we are in an interesting place. After seven years, I know many of you pretty well. Many of you pretty well. Some of you, of course, are brand new and I'm just getting to know you. And so uh, that's awesome as well. I know what to expect from many of you. I I know uh, that some of you are very hard workers and love God and this church with all of your heart. I, I know that others of you have potential, but for some reason you're holding back. Maybe you uh, think you don't have time or You think you're not interested, or I suppose possibly it's just maybe it hasn't occurred to you. But now on the flip side, you also know me pretty well. Many of you know my strengths and weaknesses, and quite honestly, some of you might know them better than I know them myself. You know what, excuse me, you know where I do pretty well and where I need improvement. I can probably get an amen on that one, can I? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Most of you love me a lot and support me no matter what, help me in my weaknesses, support me in my strengths. But for some reason, um, for some of us, it reminds me of an unsuccessful marriage. Even though this is a church, right, where our relationship is with Jesus and not the pastor. You know, last year, some of the folks in the church have had a seven year itch, right? You know, in marriage, the seven year itch, right? And some of you have come to realize that some things about me just aren't going to change. And yet, praise God, you have chosen to stay and continue to work alongside me. Others, unfortunately, have chosen to go elsewhere because they come to realize the same, the same thing. Whatever those things are, people have determined they can't live with it any longer. And I'm sure that there's still another group that is just waiting until I leave and then you'll decide to be mature Christians again. And and that reminds me, whenever I was um, first started ministry, which is over 20 years ago now, I was in a two-church charge while I was um, getting my Master's of Divinity degree. And uh, it was Dearborn and Edgerton, Missouri. I don't know if any of you know where those two towns are. They're right north of Kansas City. Dearborn worshipped about 80 in its worship service, and Edgerton had about 15 on a good day. It was literally a family church. I mean, there was like two or three generations of, of the same family that went to the Edgerton church. And um, anyway, when I went there, we were all excited, of course, as we are as we go anywhere. But it was going to take me four years to get my education. And so um, I had told the folks, you know what? Um, I plan on being here for four years because I think the last pastor was there for one or two, you know. And I said, uh, it's going to take me that long to get my education. I'm so excited to work with you in ministry. Well, my district superintendent, who is the person that Hollis talked about, who is over an area of the state, has usually about 80 churches in that area. Um, He called me after he was appointed back to a local congregation. And he says, Eric, I was wondering if you'd be my associate pastor. Now, here's the deal. I grew up in a town called Stanbury who also had 60 to 80 people worshiping in it. I knew the politics of the of the church. And those of you who don't think politics are in church um, anywhere where two or more humans are gathered together, not only is Jesus there, but politics is also there. So um, just just it's not a bad word. It is just the way we understand one another and move forward. But um, anyway, uh, so I knew that type of church and how it ran. Well, Liberty had 1,500 members. We had about 80 people, both part-time and full-time on staff. And so um, it was a really interesting change of the way the church works. And it was obvious to Jamie and me, my wife and I, 
I, I had to take this appointment. I mean, I, to, to, it would better our ministry together. We would understand, you know, the si- different sizes of the, of the churches and such and how the staff ran in each of those situations. And, but we were so scared. We didn't want to hurt the people because I had promised them I'd be there for four years. And this was two years, well, a year and a half in. And uh, Glenn Wiggs, who you've heard, if you've been around me long, you've heard me quote him often. He was that man I was talking about who was district superintendent and then uh, pastor at Liberty. And, and uh, I says, Glenn, I just don't know. I promised these folks that I'd be there for four years. I, I don't want to disappoint him and hurt him. And uh, now, just to kind of help you understand, Glenn was from southeast Missouri. Um, and he was down in Sykeston was, and south, if you can get any farther south in Missouri than that. And uh, his comment was, uh, I can't do his voice very good, but he says, well, Eric, he said, uh, you know, some of the folks in that church will dance down the aisle when you leave. And uh, so I've never thought, uh, again, the same way about leaving uh, a ministry. But um, anyway, so... Uh, some folks definitely, uh, if I were to ever leave here, I'm sure there would be folks that would dance down the aisle here because I am no longer going to be pastor here. But, um, you know, it's probably one of the hardest things about being a pastor, quite honestly. Um, usually, a person who is called by God to be a pastor loves people. A person who is called by God to be a, a pastor um, wants to please people. And, and a person who's called by God to be a pastor does not want to disappoint people. That is um, huge, typically, in the personality type that become pastors. And it's a tight rope to walk, isn't it? It's a very tight rope to walk. You see, as a pastor, if you're doing your job and you're doing what you've been called to, you, to do, you are always going to upset someone, right? I mean, for instance, just a simple example. To implement ideas that will help the church move forward is going to upset the very people that are comfortable right where they are, isn't it? I mean, there's really no way around it. If we want to move forward as a church, the people who are comfortable where the church is it's going to upset anything we do. Another group of people that it's going to upset is if they think the church should change this direction, and I understand the church should change in this direction. So, so it really is a hard thing to do to um, help people understand uh, how the church should move forward and what should happen. So if we look back at the last seven years, we've done some pretty amazing things in ministry together. And in that amount of time, we have grown our worship numbers. And over the last, um, in the last seven years, they've decreased. And then we're on the increase again. Not necessarily this morning, but, but um, I don't know, though. The first service was absolutely packed. So um, we usually have about 250, 200 to 250 um, in both services uh, added together. So it's, you know, we're increasing again in our worship numbers. We've, we've baptized many, many infants. We have baptized many, many confirmands. And we've baptized many adults that have given their life to Christ and become professing members here at Warsaw First. We've had matriarchs and patriarchs of this amazing church family die and move on to the next chapter of their life and they have left their families in charge and and some of some of the folks here at Warsaw first have done an amazing job of carrying on the traditions with the church in um, in their faithfulness and others well maybe not so much there's been a huge volume of visitors through the doors of the church in those seven years We've had ministries form and we've had ministries die. We've, um, you know, I mean, quite honestly, as I go through here, it sounds kind of like a living, breathing organism, doesn't it? Right? Um, I wonder why it would sound like a living, breathing organism. What makes up a church anyway? People, right? And what are people? Are we living, breathing organisms? Yes. Anybody who calls the church an organization, well, let me put it this way. I, am, I don't care to be a part of an organization. I want to be a part 
of an organism called the church, right? The life, the body of Christ. Um, We've had members come and then move away. We've had staff come and go. And uh, we've even had our own Timothy here at the church. His name was Justin, right? Just left us a month ago to go be a pastor down in Alabama. He and Stacy came. I mean, now, I want you to think about this. Um, Some of you know this, but others don't. They graduated from uh, Oral Roberts University with their Masters of Divinity, both he and Stacy. And they, in their first year of marriage, they moved to Korea to be English teachers. Now, just think about that for a moment. And while they were in Korea, and Katie was a part of that process, while they were in Korea, somehow they ran across the fact that we were wanting an associate pastor. And from Korea, he applied for Warsaw, Missouri, associate pastor. Isn't that just an amazing thing? It just blows me away. And so he flew in to, um, as we teasingly say, for the marathon interview that that, uh, night. And, of course, we hired him, and they were here for four years. But they came not really understanding what rubber meets the road ministry is all about, right? They knew the book theories from seminary. But this was their really first opportunity to get a first-hand look at what Rubber Meets the Road ministry is about. And guess what? You are responsible for training him up. You are responsible for sending him out to do great and amazing things for God. And no matter where he goes, from now on, trust me, folks, from now on, he will carry this church family with him whatever he does in his life. Praise God, right? And that is because of you and your ministry to him. Two major things that the leaders of this church asked of me when we came here, when Jamie and I and the boys came here, was to grow the youth and bring the church uh, to churches of the community together. Now, it was much more effective when the first four rows here were full of youth in the first service. And I I apologize to you that that isn't that way. I mean, there are youth in the first four rows of the service, right? Anita, right? Yeah. There are youth in the first four rows of this, right? I was (laughs) talking. Anyway, whatever. But um, uh, uh, because I had them stand up at this point because seven years ago, there were three youth. Three youth. And because of folks like Deanna and because of leaders like Jamie and because of numerous people in this church, we have, what, Deanna, 30 to 35 youth average on a weekly basis. We have 5 to 10 adults that are there helping out. Right, Brenda? So um, it is just an amazing ministry. Folks, they have been on seven mission trips. Think of... The ministry that has to people. And as far as I know, every mission trip, correct me guys if I'm wrong, I think we've been like the biggest youth group there, haven't we? Um, People tease when I go to conference, yeah, the Warsaw youth move in and just kind of take over, right? Um, And and I mean, there are churches that have, like I said, 1,500 members in this state and more, and there are churches that have much less than, than we do. But um, we have such an awesome youth group. We have y- awesome youth in this community and in this um, church that are active in this church. Whether they worship here, some of them worship in other churches, but they choose to worship or come to our, well, they worship sometimes. But uh, seven mission trips, they've led 14 worship services in this church over those years. They've done so many uh, service projects in this community. It is hard to uh, even list them. I mean, just yesterday, um, they waited tables for um, the uh, Benton County Historical Society. Boy, it wasn't coming. Thank you very much. Uh, just, Just yesterday evening. They do service projects all the time, raking leaves and leaving a note on the door before you even realize that they were there. Just things just like that. And now, I mean, this morning we had two beautiful gals go down to Children's Church, but we, we on average, during the school year, have um, uh, 10 to 15 children 
And there have been Sundays where we have 20 kids down in children's church during this service. Thanks to Jennifer and everybody that helps her out with that ministry. I mean, to me, that's just amazing. Amen? Um, it's just set to grow by leaps and bounds. And another thing that has happened is, is we have what's called BCYC and Voices of the Youth. Benton County Youth Coalition is BCYC. And um, it is several people in this church. It's St. Anne Catholic Church. It is Cedar Grove Baptist Church. It's several Baptist churches out around the community. Um, there are several churches that work together to form a faith-based, communi- or faith-based organization that uh, just provide activities for kids that are alcohol and drug-free. And the voices of youth are underneath that organization and plan. So then, after all this wonderful things that have happened uh, in the last seven years, and I mean, we could go on beyond that, right? Are we done? Are we done? Right? Should, should we be satisfied where we are? You see, in our scripture for today, the Apostle Paul says, not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Jesus Christ made me his own. Do you realize as you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, he has made you his own? I hope that is just amazing to you. If we continue with verse 13 in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus Let those of us then who are mature be of the same mind. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. So just like Hollis said in his in his uh, talk about annual conference, right? Should we be thinking about the last seven years? Should we be patting our backs about all the accomplishments in the last seven years? Well, you know what? Sometimes I need to see where I've come from. Do you all need to do that? You need to say, wait a minute now, let's see what we have accomplished. But do I want to brag about that? Do we need to get big heads about that? No, right? We celebrate it and we move on, right? We move on to the great things that God has. We strain forward. We press on to what God has in store for us. So, We are to press on toward the goal. And what is our goal? What is our goal? Some of you are brand new here and you you may not know, but what is the statement that we read every Sunday? To make new Christian disciples. And if you look at that statement, right, there are, and you can get out your bulletins and look at it. There's a word that all the letters in the word are capitalized. What is that letter? Or what is that word? Anybody? New, right? New. So, so our purpose, our mission, our goal is to make what? New Christian disciples. So does that mean that if we're good friends with someone who attends the Baptist church or the Lutheran church or the Catholic church and they decide to become a member here, is that our goal? No, that's not our goal. That's awesome. I mean, we don't want to take anybody away from their church, but if I'd rather them do that than not go to church at all, right? But on the other hand, our goal is to make new Christian disciples, right? New Christian disciples. Quite honestly, if all of us were making new Christian disciples, would we even notice in this service that 40 of our regular worshipers are gone? Right? We wouldn't even realize it, would we? Because every single one of us would have brought so many people to worship that the place would be full. So, what is this next year of our ministry together going to look like? What will we accomplish in Jesus' name together? What is it going to be? 
I'm not going to answer that question. I want you to answer that question. Quite honestly, I, I pray that God bothers you and bugs you, right? If you are not members of this church, if you're just coming and, and for the first few times and you think, man, I think this church has great potential to do this, man, write it down on that connection card. Let me know. That is so important for us. So we can carry through with something that you feel God calling you to do. I was reading an article by David Murrow the other day, and he said that Jesus placed three men at the core of his organization. Peter, the doer, James, the mind, and John, the emotions. Peter, James, and John. So Peter represents the doer. His default setting is to do first. Step out and do it. Let's get it done, right? Um, He's the hands. James represents the mind. His default setting is to think first. He's the head. And, and John represents the emotions. His default setting is love and feel first. He's the heart. And we wonder why John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, thought, felt so strongly in the head, the heart, and the hands of our faith. Right? Right? And, and so that is where he gets that. So Peter is the doer, James is the mind, and John is the emotions. Which are you? You know why most churches have trouble with youth and young adults, especially men and all men, quite honestly. Do you know why? Because most men and most youth are Peters. They are doers. They want to get it done, get the project done, have a project to do, get it done, and move on to the next project, right? I mean, quite honestly, most education today is more set for the female mind to sit and to listen and to learn, to watch the teacher and to understand that. Guys don't learn that way. We never have. How do we work best? How do we learn best? Hands on, right? With your dad or whomever right next to you is telling you how to put on that carburetor on the engine, right? How to take the blades off the mower, how to sharpen. You you see what I'm saying? That's how guys learn. Not by watching people lecture. Some guys, obviously you can't say all, but a large portion of us are that way. We are doers. We're like Peter, right? Some of us are kind of like James, but we like to move pretty quickly to the doer stage of that, right? Why do you think mostly guys are on a trustees team of a church? They don't like to discuss much. They want to do it, right? We're putting a bathroom in over here. It's amazing how many guys step up to say, hey, I'll help with that whenever something like that needs to be done, right? Storage down in the gym. It was great to have guys that stepped up to do that. So what are you? Are you like Peter? The doer, are you like James, the thinker? Are you like John, that was the heart? See, all three of those are needed. Jesus had all three of those personality types in his ministry, in the core of his ministry. It is important that you know what you are. So that whenever you sign up for a ministry of the church and you're not happy with it, you can say, oh, now wait a minute. Right? Now I understand why I'm not happy. What do you think most thinkers like in the church? Most people like James. What do you think they like to do? They like to form Bible studies, don't they? Right? Right? I've already said, Peters are like on the the trustees. They want to do. They want to be hands-on, right? So anyway, think about that. I want you to think about what we're going to accomplish. And I want you to ask yourself, which are you? The doers want to accomplish a project. The minds want to do more Bible study. And the lovers want to feel no matter what. Which are you? All three are important. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise. We celebrate how you work in our lives and how each of us together make a wonderful whole in Christ. Every single personality type is so important. Help us glorify you in all that we say and all that we think and all that we do, Lord. We love you so very much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.